This week, we cover the Hillbilly Squared. The entire budget went to purchasing intellectual properties instead of fixing most bugs. If you pick Legion, you're a scrub. Climbing around, hooked on you, vomit-inducing, glitch fest. I've seen enough hentai to know where this is going. The competitive version of Friday the 13th, the game. Informative murder porn. An emo cosplayer's dream. The mother of an emo cosplayer's nightmare. When are they going to add Chucky as a killer? What perk build are you running? Who is this creature who has an insatiable love for them? dead. An endless cycle of death, shitting in the tall grass, despair, and DCing, and commentary on the rat race of life game itself. This week, we are telling you why you wouldn't survive Dead by Daylight's Entity and Killers. So per the regular layout, we must first explore the lore behind why all the killers we see have stepped into the fray, and what it means for them and their master to hunt you down and decide that you would not survive. While the base lore isn't as expansive as other games, we can discern a lot from the journal entries of one Benedict Baker, a man on a mission to discern the staggering amount of disappearances in the small town of Weeks back in 1956, discovering that it had become a ghost town not because of drying up resources in a mind-centered industry, but because of the anxiety of the darkness that swept up the weary without a trace, causing those still alive to flee in fear. All questions seem to point to a focal location, the Macmillan Estate. People in the nearby town of Weatherfield weren't willing at all to aid Baker in his pursuit for the truth, so he went at it alone with the maps he found in the Weatherfield Library. Shortly after embarking on his harrowed journey, Baker found himself waking up in a mysterious mysterious and foggy place that showed no sign of day or night, whilst a fire burned at his side. If he attempted to wade through the seemingly endless bog, a shadow of a daunting man would stand before him, emanating a dark presence that would mentally force him to return to his original flame. While this presence stalks him from afar, a much more terrifying being known as the Entity is seen plucking unfortunate souls from their plane of existence to an eternity of pain and torture. It would appear that the realm Baker had been placed in was one of an infinitely repeating horror, a game with no end, an unbearable pain with no climax, and sadism with no sedation. Baker was in a limited space where a foggy world reminiscent of rundown mills, neighborhoods, and forests would play out slightly differently day to day, like a twisted version of Bill Murray in Groundhog Day. The entity offering a means of escape to give a slight glimmer of hope as some sort of twisted betrayal as he would soon find himself back at the damnable fire and soon another gated precinct where the entity horrendously slaughters and drags away its victim's soul just to play with it once again. But upon each death, Baker described his being as feeling weaker with each life lost. In order to make this game of never-ending death and despair more terrifying, the jagged entity would summon great evils from places of great darkness. This entity would make a deal with the summoned killers. These dark beings had to obey the will of the entity, no matter the cost, and in return they could maim, kill, and torture to their heart's content, as long as they would offer the damned souls to their new lord by impaling them on sacrificial hooks, all while giving the survivors a chance to escape each time. Most killers would relish the fact at having an endless stream of murders, especially looking at the face of the same person over and over again, but others resented the fact that they had to follow the orders of anyone but themselves. But the entity was far more powerful than they could even fathom, so a deal would always be struck. It is unknown if the torture and sacrifice of innocence fuels and keeps the entity alive, but more survivors and killers are being consumed into this realm for an endless game of cat and mouse. As Baker describes this bloody mouse will in his journal, what defines reality? Is it just that you can taste and touch? Feel the pain as the blade slides in between your ribs. Taste the iron-tinged flavor of blood in your mouth and the smell of death as the darkness takes you? Is it hope that drives you on, hoping that the next time will bring your actual death? or hope that the exit reveals a way back home? I yearn for some kind of escape, be it death 
or life. The entity appears to become more powerful with the more innocence and more depraved it includes in its realm, enveloping memories and places akin to the killers to thicken the darkness more and more. Baker's last journal entry is a forewarning and advice to those who bear his fate. Death is not death. In this place, life is fleeting. To whomever might find this lore, I can but only provide you with one advice. Always move forward. This is what keeps me alive, and have so for a while. If I were to advise further, I would suggest you harvest every forsaken location for anything that might thwart the horrors that lurk within, and keep an eye on the gates. If they do open, you must flee. I hope my scribbles have not been in vain. If you do find this lore, make use of it and pass it on. If you find me, bury my body. This journal dated November 1896, showing either a decline in sanity, a decline in the continuity, or that time was abstracted in the entity's realm. Now with that HP Lovecraft story time out of the way, let's put ourselves in the shoes of one of these survivors. If you are one of those ballsy people who thinks of themselves as invincible and can't die, well, if this bleak scenario didn't bust your bubble, I frankly don't know what to tell you. Point being is that entering into the realm of the entity will put you into a torturous state of limbo, where escape is just a temporary solace. You will need to use your stealth, cunning, ingenuity with power generator repairs, and either self-sacrifice or betrayal to survive, and if you don't know how to pull off any of these listed, well, you're gonna learn today! You gonna learn today! I don't know many people my age that can actively repair machinery like this, since most people below the age of 40 aren't too handy with trade school-like work. That's not a jab at my generation or the previous generation. That's just the truth. I can't do that kind of shit, and it is necessary to repair these generators in order to escape, and these repairs must be made while an insane killer is on the loose. So you're looking at bomb defusal squad levels of stress and pressure. And not only that, but you're also gonna have to mend your own wounds that could be deep enough to kill you, and you will have to heal other people to make sure they stay alive as well. And to those people who are going to just bust in here and say, well, me and my trusty insert make and model of gun could take out whoever in no time flat. Well, buddy, there ain't no guns or bringing guns to the entity's realm here. The only weapon you could possibly bring is a knife you find on the ground to temporarily stun the killers, or a fun little flashlight to blind them for a second or two. What I'm saying is, you're you're not going to be on the offense. You're basically a rat in a maze where the cat is plowing through the walls half the time. And the cat is the killer, and the entity is the scientist studying your every pathetic move. The entity will place one of many killers before you and a few others to evade and escape from. But unlike my other why you wouldn't survive scenarios, fighting back is barely an option, keeping you within a limited space where your only options are to either power on five generators to open a gate, to escape, leave through a hatch, or to simply be be murdered ruthlessly or be hooked and sacrificed hellishly to the entity. I think it's self-explanatory that once you're within the entity's realm that you cannot escape and going from campfire to random murder scenario, eventually you will have your life force completely sapped. But let's just take into consideration the history, power, abilities, and mannerisms of the killers. You know, the point of the video. Starting off in the south, where apparently the rate of murderous, bloodthirsty humans seems to escalate quickly, we have the devious Evan Macmillan, otherwise known as the Trapper, a man that once put his father on a pedestal due to his vast wealth and hefty estate they curated together. His father, Archie, would slowly start to have his mind waste away, possibly due to Alzheimer's, with many people seeking to be written into his will. Evan went mad against the workers on the estate, specifically those in their tunnel systems, detonating to TNT within the mines, killing and trapping hundreds of them. Evan eventually forced his father into their basement, leaving him there to starve. With his obsession of trapping those that come to seek his fortune, Evan, the trapper, would place bear traps in unassuming places to severely snap the legs of survivors, causing them to scream in pain so that he may find them for a due sacrifice. His brute strength, reminiscent of Lenny Small from Of Mice and Men, not knowing his own strength and being able to plow through stacks of 2x4s with ease. But most notable is his rusted cleaver to cut down those who flee from him. He walks as any normal man, but the danger lies in not knowing if you're going to fall for one of his trap cards. The fact that you'll probably have your foot stuck in a bear trap and trying to free yourself and trying to run away on a snapped leg, yeah, it's not going to work out for you. Staying in the general area of Southern inhospitality, a small boy named Max Thompson Jr. was born to a wealthy family, much like the trapper before. Except for poor Jr.'s sake, his parents Max 
Max Senior and Evelyn saw their son born as a disfigured and horrible sight. As to not be seen with such a horrid looking heir, the parents never divulged the existence of their son and walled and chained him off into total isolation in a singular room to be fed through a small hole in a wall being called a mistake and disappointment for years until he was a teenager. He eventually broke free and mercilessly slaughtered his parents and mutilated the farm animals to become a living myth known simply as the hillbilly. Wielding a cattle hammer to bash in the brains of anyone that wanders into the farmland, he also wields a chainsaw that, maybe from his blood-curdling tarades of the past, sends him into a violent rampage, which makes him run just a shade under the speed of Usain Bolt. I assume. It's safe to say how easy it would be to be taken down by an insane man with faster than normal speeds chopping you up with a chainsaw. Now following in the same vein of a southern chainsaw wielding maniac who owes his insanity to a not so functional family, we do have Leatherface or the Cannibal. Hailing from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise, Bubba Sawyer was raised in a loving, overbearing, and cannibalistic family in the good old Lone Star State. It was his family that instilled him the ideas of fear for his family family and the outside world. The outside world and its judgmental gaze. Any outsiders had to be dealt with with swift, brutal, and unending torment that served for dinner in bite-sized pieces. Much like any giant redneck wearing the skin of the face of his victims, believe me, there's a few of those down here in the south. He also has brutish strength and has the ability to see where any survivor is once he has hooked someone for sacrifice, making any kind of stealth or rescue attempts to be that much more difficult. Using a a cattle hammer to bash in the brains of any trespassers, it only takes him one decisive strike to impair someone and another to finish the job and completely kill them. And of course, Leatherface also famously uses the movie's namesake Chainsaw to cut down the innocent. And if he misses his flurry of chainsaw swings and hits an object or just never ends up hitting them that isn't a victim, he will go into a tantrum, swinging his weapon wildly, giving time for long distance people to get away. But if you're near him during in this tantrum, don't expect to have any appendages left. He hates to disappoint those that raised him, so he will not give up the chase, unless you get in a pickup truck and drive away, which I don't think the entity is in good supply of any motor vehicles for you to escape in. Resorting to a less than laughing matter, a man named Kenneth Chase, born in 1932 to a mother that died during his birth and a father that resented him for it, Kenneth spent his time becoming proficient at running and track events, but what caught his interest the most was collecting the feathers of birds one in particular he knocked out with some anesthetic he stole from a dentist. Once he knocked it out, he choked it to death for its pristine feathers. Moving on to small animals, taking their paws, and eventually killing a young man that he cut the finger off in his cigar box. After his father discovered the box of trophies, Kenneth fleed and was soon hired by a traveling circus for his strength and speed. He would eventually use his new social personality known as Jeffrey Hawk, as well as his guise as a clown, to lure people in, knock them out with anesthetic, torture them, pick their most attractive finger, kill them, and add said finger to his collection. The circus would eventually find out his sinister addiction, and once again, he had to flee. Going from circus to circus, luring people in John Wayne Gacy style and harvesting fingers. He would see to using a larger than usual butterfly knife to stab victims to death and removing their fingers easily. But more terrifying is his use of a mixture of anesthetics and muscle relaxants into the afterpiece tonic, a noxious cloud of gas that can daze and confuse his victims, which would intoxicate a survivor, leaving them partially blind, inhibit their motor skills, and causing choking and asphyxiation, leaving them to be easy prey. He can use the power of the entity to also block the path of any survivors that try to vault away in the same way he had vaulted earlier, making escape more difficult. If you're caught by this man, expect a one finger discount before your soul is hooked and sent to the abyss. Jumping into the opposite end of the employment spectrum, one Herman Carter was a child prodigy in terms of understanding how the human mind worked. The CIA adopted him into a secret program where he was mentored by a Mr. Stamper, instilling in him his protocol the idea that knowledge and information was power. The CIA would leave interrogations to these two men, who were adopting new methods of torture that yielded results. And one question how torturous Herman the Dr. Carter's methods were. After years of leaving him to his own devices, CIA officials finally pried into
to the results and found the terrorists and criminals to either be dead or in a vegetative state from severe head trauma. The doctor even subjected his mentor Stamper to this, opening his skull and planting electrodes in his brain, all while keeping him alive and attempting to master the art of mind control. Stamper's brain was alive, but very much gone. The doctor disappeared, leaving behind his plans to control the minds of the masses through torturous means. Using what's simply called the stick, he is able to electrocute and stun his victims like a police baton with barbs. Thanks to the entity, Will began to invoke the mind into madness, hallucinating the presence of the doctor, not knowing if the one standing before him is an illusion or the real doctor about to grab them and sacrifice their mortal soul. The doctor is able to create these illusions to trap people, trick them, and to show their location so you'll never know when you'll be struck down by the real deal. Also, using your mind against you and any kind of psychological torment that can be brought on through torture. Next up, adorning Whiteface and a litany of sequels, spinoffs, and reboots, we terrifyingly present the most evil face to grace the silver screen. Mike Myers! Oh crap, that's the wrong one. Oh, we'll go back, go back, go back. Michael Myers. Born and simply labeled as a demon in a child's body after killing his teenage sister at the age of six, dressed as a clown on Halloween of all days, he was institutionalized for 15 years before breaking out and stalking Jamie Lee Curtis, killing all of her friends in the process while his psychiatrist Loomis attempts to track him down and bring him back to the loony bin. Even after a final confrontation and multiple gunshots to the torso, and even two straight to the head later on in the sequel and an oxygen related explosion that forced him into a coma, he still walks the earth. A man that used his mask to become the shape and leave behind his humanity. His only purpose was to kill. Wielding a rather large kitchen knife, his almost unkillable and quiet demeanor makes for a near assassin-like being. His tendencies rely on becoming obsessed with vanquishing just one sole person and anyone in the way or near that target will be the spoils of war. If you are the obsession of his interest, abandon all hope as the knife penetrates your spine and innards. Many killers will hide themselves behind a mask or cloak to hide what humanity they left behind. And for Sally Smithson, this would be a similar procedure. After bearing the news that her husband passed away in a lumber mill accident, she was desperate to find work and resorted to working the night shift at an insane asylum. Working there for two decades, Sally was subjected to the crazed mindset and physical abuse for far too long. She deemed the mentally ill as impure and one fateful night sought to purifying them by what you probably assume a killer would resort to, killing them all. Those that saw this purification process as evil were also purified, killing four staff members of the asylum as well. They attempted to hospitalize her and soon sent her to the very place that drove her mad. But as the ambulance was wheeling her away, she executed everyone in the vehicle and vanished into the nearby woods. She wields a rusty bone saw that she puts her full body into motion to attack survivors. But this fine-toothed blade isn't the epitome of her dangerous design. Bargaining with the entity and harnessing the last breath of her former Warden Spencer, she was gifted the power to slip her energy and body into the spirit world in order to ambush and blink herself in front of or behind the weary in an instant to incapacitate them. If you attempt to mend your wounds inflicted by her rusted saw, she will know of your whereabouts and use her nurse-like intellect to blink to your location and she also has the ability to hear labored breathing far more easily than a normal person, making running and hiding much more difficult as you try to heal and run away. Another lovely lady by the name of Simply Anna, who was born and raised into hunting and living in the harsh winter forests with her mother in a rickety old cabin. Her mother taught her all the basics of outdoor survival, and one fateful day as they attempted to hunt down a fearsome elk due to rations running low, the elk was able to impale her mother, with the mother able to stab it to death before collapsing. Anna witnessed her mother slowly die as she hummed her favorite tune, leaving her to survive in the frozen environment on her own, with no other human being to interact with. The years of primal hunting changed her, and eventually humans that wandered into her territory were the ultimate prey, hacking them down with a broad axe and, and throwing hatchets to take down her scared victims from afar. She finds herself keeping trinkets of her fallen victims, but also cannot commit to killing little girls, forcing them to live with her, tied by the neck to the wall so they won't die alone in the wilderness, much like the fear that she had when her mother died as a little girl. However, starvation would be the ultimate end to all of these girls, 
all the same. Seeing these girls die drove her insane, and she actively would go into villages to slaughter families just to kidnap their daughters to repeat this process ad nauseum. Once the Second World War tore through these forests, the villages evacuated, and the Huntress had nothing to cling to anymore and disappeared within these woods. Wearing a rabbit mask to probably lull predators into a false sense of prey, and to attempt to relate with her little girls, she hums the lullaby her dead mother sang to her as she cascades through the woods. Her decade of hunting and gathering to stay alive have made her a killing machine. No matter your proximity, you will most likely find an axe in your back for the sport of it. And to any little girls watching, which my demographics say is an extremely small percentage, and age restrictions probably have you not watching these, your fate will be worse than a swift death at her hand, as you're strapped to a wall, sung to in a creepy tune, and starved to death over a long period of time. Amongst the women forever changed by their environment, one girl by the name of Amanda Young really brings home the bacon. John Kramer, who we know as Jigsaw, had lost his unborn son to a junkie years ago, attempting to give birth to a child during the year of the pig, representing fertility and rebirth. But when his son passed away, the pig took on a more vile meaning, subjecting the junkie to the ultimate test. He would soon go on to acclimate sinners and the ne'er-do-wells of society to either learn from their sins or die trying. Whether it be contraptions that cut them in half or headgear that crushed their skulls to a pulp, there would always be an end. He would use the corpses of pigs to symbolize this trend, and after successfully surviving John's test, Amanda Young quickly took to becoming his disciple after a lifetime of pain and suffering. John had developed cancer and wanted Amanda to take over the visor of the pig and keep his will moving forward. She, however, decided she could not live without her master, and that any people that were put to the test were just not worthy of living in the first place. John saw her waning spirit and put her to one more test, but she was ultimately shot, where she imagines herself truly as the pig she had become accustomed to. After John's death, she went to carry on his will as this new being, but kept to her vigil that no one was worthy of redemption as she was. Working with a hidden blade, she can shank and slit the throats of the unworthy, but most frightening is Jigsaw's Baptism, a contraption legendary from the Saw series that will be placed on a victim's head. If you try to escape with this contraption on your head, you will suffer a painful, almost decapitation-like death, and the only way to remove it is a slim chance with one of many trap removal machines scattered around your play area. You must place your hands into the device and suffer painful torment as you try to solve the puzzle that you can't even see. However, it's not even guaranteed that mangling your hands in each specific device will undo the trap. If you can't handle your hands being mangled or manage to find the right device, you will be stuck wandering while the pig cuts down the rest of your fellow survivors. While it may not seem as bad as the devices Jigsaw had used in his many movies, the fact that the actual killer is hunting you down with the device strapped to your head and possibly being hooked alive is fearsome enough. Stepping into the more spiritually gifted and deadly realm, an immigrant named Philip Ojomo, or Ohomo, sorry if I got this wrong, was able to slip in and out of eyesight with ease, working at a corrupt scrapyard where shady business dealings would occur. Within his homeland, criminal activity was a norm he was numb to, ignoring it all while crushing vehicles in a car compactor. However, that ignorance would come rearing its ugly head when he spotted blood protruding from one of these cars about to be crushed, and freed a bound and gagged man in the trunk. Ojomo let him loose until Ojomo's boss caught and slit the man's throat, explaining to Philip that every car he had crushed up to this point had a person inside. As a side business, this junkyard was doing. Ojomo, feeling an overwhelming sense of guilt and anger, threw his boss in the compactor and then watched his body squish out enough to where he ripped off his boss's head along with the spine from the crusher, using his boss to get ahead in life, and afterwards, much like any other killer, disappeared after that. This backstory really doesn't tie into how Ojomo became his voodoo vanishing self anyways. I don't see him crushing people, but he does use the skull and spine of his dead boss as a scythe to slaughter the innocent. He may have created the cast iron wailing bell after his mind was warped and to fall into murder and revenge. With the use of the bell, possibly imbued with the darkness of the entity, Ojomo, now called the Wraith, can become nearly invisible while moving around, totally invisible when standing stationary, and he does have increased speed while he is cloaked. Benedict Baker described his experience with the Wraith as impossible to track, unless you can catch the reflection off of his clear body in just the right light, and before you know it, he is behind you, going, Omae wa mou shindeiru. NANI?!
The Wraith can also pick up the scent of drawn blood, and can also hear the running of survivors much more easily. Being able to track you, sneak up behind you, and stab you in the back, you'll be dead before you even realized where Ojomo was. Slipping in and out of physical sight seems to be a trend for some of these killers, with one residing from Japan, a Miss Rin Yamaoko. Living in a family that wanted the best for her education, their debts accumulated faster than they could manage, with everyone, including her mother, father, and herself, working as much as they could in a futile attempt to keep up with declining funds. The father was given the blame by his boss for their company going under, and was fired after 22 years of service. Rin's father became so blind enraged that he drew the family katana and dismembered his wife piece by piece, cutting open her chest, leaving her body a bloody mess. Ren came home to see this awful tragedy, and then was attacked by her father, who cut her arms, thighs, and knocked her out of a two-story window. She was ready to accept death, and was awaiting it, but her demand for revenge was swelling up inside her. That was when the entity bargained with her. She swore her soul and body to undo this dishonor upon her family, and slipped into a different being known as the Spirit. Killing her father, she bestowed upon herself the family katana, stained with the blood of the entire family, and would use it to cut down anyone the entity wished, slipping into her hand as a retractable weapon. The contract with the entity bestowed upon her the power to slip into an ethereal plane at will, but only for a brief period of time. While in the separate plane, she can't see the survivors and she cannot see them, but can estimate their whereabouts through scratch marks and blood at high speeds and either grab them or nothing personal kid them in any instant. Her ability to appear and reappear and dash towards us unseen is a really true terror. And all while armed with a concealed katana, her disembodied body and near nudity will leave for a hair-raising death. Women of torture within this realm tend to spread their trauma and amplify it upon the world, as was the case for Lisa Sherwood, native to a peaceful village where she was taught by elders to draw out charms for good fortune and favor. She was caught in a storm while walking through the woods when she fell, hitting her head and passing out. She was kidnapped in her unconscious state and brought into a cannibalistic cabin where she was chained to the wall along with other victims. The cannibals carving at their flesh with rusted metal, keeping them alive while they ate their freshly torn flesh. Lisa witnessed many die from blood loss or organ failure or tetanus or many other ailments, and she too feared the same fate as she was also deprived of nutrition. Her arms had become so withered she was able to free herself from her shackles. She did not even have the strength to move and wrote out the symbol her elders taught her before dying, these symbols unlocking an ancient evil power that empowered her to reanimate with nothing but bloodlust in mind, completely slaughtering and eating the very cannibals that tortured her for so long, becoming the hag. The deformities of bare bone protruding through gangrenous flesh have given her razor-sharp claws that can gash open your torso, but beyond her physical disadvantage turned advantage, the elders' symbols would be used with the infusion of the entity's meddling, allowing her to write these symbols onto the ground in blackened blood. If a living survivor were to approach one of these ten laid out symbols, an illusion of her will erupt to frighten them, allowing the hag to know where they are and sometimes to even teleport to them and swipe left on their life before dragging them to the sacrificial hook. She also dabbles into hexing survivors, making their trials much more difficult, such as hexing generators making them extremely harder to repair unless you can cleanse the scattered totems around the map, hexing survivors who rescue each other from from hooks until the point where she is allowed to outright slaughter them without the need of a sacrifice, and put a hex on survivors to where using their natural senses to read where she is are much harder to tap into. Her tricks and devious nature make it hard to plan a strategy of escape. Probably the most well-known human that took on ethereal powers was a simple janitor who suffered from a fiery fate. Freddy Krueger was a custodian who hid himself behind the veil of kindness and empathy, only to trick and slaughter those fooled by his fake identity. Identity. The local townspeople cornered him and burned him to death, thinking his reign of terror was over. Well, for his realm of existence, yes, but he was slipping into the dream world, where Freddy gained the ability to enter people's nightmares and have the ability to, of course, if you die in your dream, you die in real life. With whatever method of murder he chooses there, being able to manipulate his form and the dream at his own will. He focused his hate and intentions of murder toward Nancy Holbrook, where he slaughtered most of her friends and Johnny Depp. Her plans were foiled by the 
the equally strong-willed boyfriend Quentin Smith, allowing them to temporarily kill Freddy until he returned and tormented Quentin's dreams for months, withering his will and fighting power so he could strike. The strength in Freddy is much like Pennywise in the fact that he preys upon your fears to weaken your will and make it that much easier to cut you down with his clawed glove, which may look like a funny way to shear your bushes, but it's much more fashion to shear your head off. Freddy can only work within the confines of people's dreams, whether they are asleep or in a comatose state. While this was a classic case of the waiting game in his original world, the entity allowed Freddy to place someone in a half-sleep state so that he may harm them, but they can still do necessary functions like fixing generators and saving others. Survivors can wake each other up with loud noises in order to escape Freddy's long arm of the claw. Freddy, however, becomes more enraged and encouraged to fight when generators are fixed, much like his anger to obsess over someone who was able to defeat him. This anger makes him faster and deadlier in the long run, and if he is able to hook you or someone else when the exit gates have been opened, he can temporarily have the gates barbed and shut by the entity. It's easier said than done to try to stay awake and live against Freddy, and if you enter his realm of consciousness, your fears and hopes will be put to a deadly test. So if he can shape into anything while in a dream state, what kind of hope do you have, as many of us do not have plot-armored will to fight back against Freddy. A lot of us think we're these strong-willed people who are just indestructible, but when it comes down to a giant spider or a giant machine that's about to ready to murder you, you really think in your dreams you're going to overpower that? I seriously doubt that. While Freddy's tormenting never abided by the laws of life and death, certain folk simply stuck to lawlessness and pack mentality. A group called the Legion would be created, starting with their leader, Frank Morrison, who was quite a personality who jumped from adoptive home to adoptive home, eventually landing in a small snowy town of less than 6,000 people, where he met up with a beauty with big dreams named Julie. Julie's future parties would also introduce him to her friends, the Ready for Anything Joey and the shy but easy manipulated Susie. Frank would send them on a misguided path, partaking in all sorts of hooligan activity, adorning masks to hide their identities to continue their juvenile crime sprees, eventually all obeying Frank's every command as they resided in an abandoned lodge to revel in each day's escapades. Joey was fired at his day job, and Frank dared the group to ransack and vandalize the place. But as they were breaking and entering, a custodian showed up and grabbed Julie, asking what they were doing there. Frank instinctively stabbed the man in the back and commanded his followers to do the same, all either attacking on command to stab him in the gut or ribs, or hesitating until they were scolded. They went to hide the body in the snowy slopes of Mount Ormond, and when Frank went to chase his shadow into the woods, he disappeared, leaving only his snow-tracked footprints as a trace. His group would follow him to the darkness that the entity invited them into, now imbued with the sense of murder that enveloped them all at that moment. Any one of them could show up with the will to kill, adorning a rather larger hunting knife that can cause heavy bleeding after a critical stab wound if the Legion member has entered a state of feral frenzy. The depth of this wound will cause you to excessively bleed out, and if not treated, quickly will cause you to fall to the ground and become incapacitated or even pass out. It's the game and pleasure of the Legion that leaving a blood trail and having their victims panic to suture their wounds that they can leave them to be so they can hunt the other remaining three survivors. Trails of blood and pain-soaked breathing that they can hunt down their damaged goods once again. This state will also cause them to run at you full sprint like a wild animal, and while unable to break through defenses and can easily vault over obstacles, their normal state will keep them at a normal pace and prevent stabbing survivors deep enough to cause heavy bleeding, but can still get the job done with enough slashes. It is probably the rush of knowing they are killers now that empowers them to enter bloodless like feral states of mind. While they only ever experience the action of murder once before appearing as soldiers of the entity, they can still use their newly imbued powers to hunt down their prey in a childish manner. The same can be said for the mysterious Danny Jed Olson Johnson, a regular teenager who watched one too many horror movies, learning the cliches, and wanted to reenact the lifestyle of the killers he began to admire. Hello? What's your favorite scary movie? <laughs> Donning a ghost mask, he became known as Ghostface, hiding his identity as he discreetly and indiscriminately killed his fellow students and friends after weeks of researching their habits and daily schedules. He was gaining a head rush from their bloody deaths and even self-mutilating himself. Much like a run-of-the-mill human killer, he wields a large knife. But yeah, something this sharp that can penetrate your guts and disembowel you. However, while the Legion will play with their prey and watch them bleed out, Ghostface will not hesitate to sink his 
his knife straight into the victim's stomach or chest repeatedly and literally gut them. His studies into his victims allows him to appropriately sneak up on them without a sound and take them out without a whisper. He is also harder to hear and detect as he roams about and with the power of the entity can block repairs of generators when he picks up people to hook them for sacrifice. While Danny is basically just a calculating killer mastermind for a small suburb, his knowledge and cunning while brandishing a large bladed weapon will probably lead to your hooked downfall. And last of the killers before we get into two more announced, this one will probably leave you sick to your stomach. No, not probably, will leave you sick to your stomach. A girl named Adiris was tossed into a life of servitude at the tender age of five. She became of age and tended to cleansing the temple she had worked in with her priests as an apprentice. A pandemic level plague had swept through the civilization outside the temple's walls and found its way in, infecting the priests, leaving only Adiris, a novice who only assisted in purifications to cleanse the majority of the people asking to be helped of this terrible ailment. Nervous, she stood before the clergy and masses and retreated to the back to find the will to aid them, finding a small opening to a crypt where a statue of a goddess-like woman stood, giving Adiris a sign that the gods had graced her with purpose, she bestowed upon herself the riches, jewelry, and ceremonial dagger to anoint her new status, severing her own toe as an offering to the gods to cure the plague from a blackened-footed woman. This sight of a glistening goddess caused the public to revere her as a godly priestess known as the High Priestess of Babylon. However, her trials and godhood wouldn't last long as the plague would seep into her body, creating abscesses, coughing up phlegm and blood, and her feet blackening. She wore a head wrap and masked her odor with the fragrances of her censer to hide the ill fate of her decaying body from the public and eventually fled from the city to conceal the truth, excluding some followers that would make their way with her up north. Eventually, the plague would swell up to her feet to unwalkable conditions, vomiting almost non-stop. She stopped in a cold, damp cave where it dawned on her followers that she and them were doomed to die of the cursed plague. She prayed and wished for something more with her diminishing, wretched life as her dreams of grandeur were fading. These prayers were answered in horrible fate as the entity reached out to her, offering a sense of godhood at the cost of innocent lives. And if anything were to be deadly to mankind, it would be pestilence and plague. She can vomit on survivors at very long distances, infecting them with this plague or surrounding objects with the vile plague. The very fountains she used as cleansing pools can be found around the area to clean thyself of this affliction, but coming at a bloody cost. If the plague comes to a now corrupted fountain, she can use this corruption to darken her own infection and spit out a blood-infused vomit that can sear the flesh of a survivor and can incapacitate them from afar for a brief period. So you're basically in a case of damned if you do and damned if you don't, dealing with a disease that will change dependent on if you want to be infected or burned alive. Also, vomiting on generators and boxes can leave you hesitant to merely touch your only means of escape, lest ye risk infection of the plague. Disease is a whole different ballpark after facing so many murderous psychopaths brandishing tools of mayhem and destruction. You can fight somebody with a bladed weapon, but how can you fight a disease on the spot? If me explaining all 16 of these killers wasn't enough to explain how they could kill you, well, bottom line of all of this is that eventually you will succumb to their sadistic vices. Trapped in an eternal game of cat and mouse, the entity will constantly reset you into the most heart-pounding scene of a horror movie, and it's up to you and your waning will to fight off one of these 16 and growing killers, learning how they hunt, attack, and analyze your movements and tactics, with you dying time and time again, feeling the searing pain of a blade in your entrails, a bludgeoning hammer to your skull, or the terrifying effects of anesthetic or disease ravaging your body and mind. It is when your soul and will have all but withered, when the entity completely devours your mortal spirit and eternally wipes it from existence into an eternity of suffering and torment. It's easy to say we could survive against one or two of these killers after watching their downfalls on movies and video games so many times before, but we we as normal humans, only defending ourselves with flashlights, firecrackers, and breakaway knives, can't bear the torment of this eternal hellhole, and the void of the non-existence will probably be a welcome gift in the midst of all this bleak, timeless future. Unless you are proficient in generator repairs and medical procedures, have a high tolerance for pain and suffering, and I'm not just talking about your emotional day-to-day -day emotional bullshit, but actual knives and swords deep in your body, and have
have the mental fortitude to restrain stealth and cunning and most importantly sanity against people like Freddy, you may stand a chance within your first few trials. If not, you're gonna learn pretty quick, but all will eventually become sustenance for the entity and its jagged clutches. Even Ash Williams himself couldn't do it. But that's probably because they took away his frickin' chainsaw, man! <laughs>